My name is Ware Harmon. I'm the Executive Director of Town Hall Seattle. And on behalf of our staff here and our friends at Third Place Books, it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation of Jack E. Davis and Deborah Jensen. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And we thank you all for joining us tonight, whether it's here in our forum or at home, in the comfort of your own fill-in-the-blank domestic space. Uh, we're grateful that you've joined us for a program that should run around 60 minutes, including a Q&A where um, the program really shifts to you and uh, you'll have an opportunity to pose your own questions um, to uh, Jack Davis uh, to participate. Use um, go to meet.ps forward slash Davis, or you can scan that QR code right there on the screen now or on your screen at home. Um, and that's the easiest way to submit your question. And the reason we do that even for in-room questions is that it folds them all up into one easy to use, um, easy to use uh, stream um, for our interviewer. So uh, the link, as I mentioned, is dropped in the chat as well. And you can submit your question at any time. And the sooner the better, because then it's a smooth transition. Um, we'll try to get to as many as possible. And a reminder that if you want to view the program using closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of your video player. It applies to some of you, not the others, and you know who you are. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming, uh, Alexander Zaychik and Kiana Scott will discuss the relationship between government-funded medical research and the drug companies that exercise monopolistic control of those discoveries in the marketplace, while Cambridge paleontologist David Bainbridge will share a beautifully illustrated story of the development of that field, documenting humans' evolving understanding of the world that preceded and produced us. Both events are live stream only, and the latter in particular is an example of some of the wonderful events that are only possible online. So visit our website to join our email list and get updates throughout the season. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arno G. Matulski Science Lecture Series is supported by Microsoft. Um, but as you likely know, if you've heard any of these pre-show announcements before, uh, Town Hall is at heart a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members joining us tonight. If you share their belief that our community is energized and inspired through questions of politics, science, and culture, I hope you'll consider membership too. There's information on our website. One last point before introducing. I know you'll want to go deeper into tonight's topic, so I recommend purchasing your own copy of Jack Davis's wonderful book from our friends at Third Place. We've made it easy for you. Folks who are here can visit the table right over there in the auto. Actually, I think we'll be signing over there, so there may well be books on, on the, in the library side for you. Or use the link in the chat below to get your copy if you're watching from home. And with all of that, Historian Jack E. Davis teaches environmental history and sustainability studies at the University of Florida, where he holds the Rothman Family Endowed Chair in the Humanities. A 2003 Fulbright Scholar, he's previously taught in Amman at the University of Jordan, the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and Eckerd College. Davis received the 2018 Pulitzer Prize for History for his book, The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea. Other notable and award-winning works include 2011's An Everglades Providence, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and the American Environmental Century, a kind of dual biography of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and the Everglades, and 2001's Race Against Time, Culture and Separation in the Natchez Since 1930. Other books have included Making Waves, Female Activists in 20th Century Florida, and The Civil Rights Movement from 2000. Deborah Jensen is the Vice President and Executive Director for Audubon Washington. Deborah has dedicated her career to conservation with decades of executive experience leading advocacy, education, and scientific organizations. She currently serves on the Puget Sound Leadership Council and the Board of Climate Solutions and is past chair of the Washington Wildlife and Recreation Coalition. Jack E. Davis's new book, The Bald Eagle, The Improbable Journey of America's Bird, is the subject of tonight's discussion. Please join me in welcoming Deborah Jensen and Jack E. Davis. working? Okay, great. Thanks for coming out this evening. Looks like mine's working too. Yours is working as well. I think we're set. So Jack, why don't you start off by reading us a little bit from the book, just to get us in the spirit okay. of the moment, and sure. then we can go I'd to Q&A's. I'd be Q happy to, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm, I will read the 
um, uh, first few opening paragraphs to the book. And I'm reading them from this printout because um, that, the opening changed a little bit from the advanced copy to the final hard copy. Standing at the rocky edge of a stream, a bald eagle scans its surroundings with luminous eyes. Satisfied, it unfurls its wings straight up, drops into a crouch, and in one fluid motion pushes skyward, sweeping its seven-foot wingspan out and down. The eagle rises slowly at first, legs and feet hanging like pendants. Its powerful wings beat hard against the air, and it continues to rise. Limbs draw up for the journey ahead. Nesting season has come to its inevitable end, and migration has begun. As fall slips toward winter, bald eagles across western Alaska have been called to a distant place, a place they, have pursu they pursue annually throughout their lifetimes, as did their ancestors in their lifetimes. Their exodus from seasonal territories proceeds not in a mass or in crowded ways. There are no herding calls sounded to a group, no flocks gathering for takeoff, no wedges of flight piercing the sky. Instead, each bird, even the young ones not long from the nest, follows its own impulse to leave, and over a period of weeks, thousands of eagles set out individually on a solitary journey duplicated by multitudes. Seeking a southwesterly course, wind in their faces, sun on their backs, they eventually roll out over the Aleutian Islands. Each island in the trackless sea below is an ancient link in a migration route mapped in the eagle's evolutionary memory. Tracing it from several hundred to several thousand feet up, they continue to fly solo, loosely spaced a half a mile or more apart in streams 20 to 30 miles long, soaring on favorable winds where they exist and pumping wings providently where they don't. Each passing day grows stingier with light, granting barely six hours between the dim interludes of dawn and dusk. Well before sunset, the journeying birds descend to some remembered place, resting place en route. They fish for re-nourishment and then settle down in trees or on rock ledges for the night. The next morning they fish again and then lift above the dewy haze one by one to push on. If the weather is clear, these daylight flyers will travel a hundred or more miles before another night of rest. A favorite stopover is the island of Amaknak, a four-day journey from their mainland territories, if they don't linger. Amaknak is also the final destination and winter residence for many of the eagles. As it comes into sight, they wheel toward its green and rocky hills. On descent, primary flight feathers splay and twist, tail feathers pitch upward and downward. Horizontal wings dance on fickle air currents. Heads dip forward, and keen eyes pick out landing spots as each nimble bird floats in. Legs reach down and toes spread to meet the upward surging ground in a near balletic landing. Wings close in a final bow. Have you been transported? I hope so. So Jack, your last book was a biography of a place, the Gulf of Mexico. And I think some of your other work has been more about places. Tell us, how did you come to write this biography of a bird? What brought you to this story? Um, yeah, so the, the, the uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas biography um, was a, a dual biography of a place and, and, a, and a person, and then the, the Gulf was a biography of a place. And um, I, I like the biographic form, apparently, uh, obviously, but I'm also I, I'm an environmental writer, and I don't know where the idea came from to write about the bald eagle. Uh, I, it, just, uh, it just came from somewhere, and when I started thinking about it, it made sense. I mean, we see, we're seeing more and more bald eagles every day, every year. I mean, it's just spectacular. I think most of us growing up in this room didn't grow up with bald eagles in the wild. They just weren't around that much, more so in your part of the country than, than in my part and than, than in the southeast. And, uh, and so I, I, I thought that, you know, maybe uh, people ought to know a little bit about this 
this bird and its history with it with the American people. Uh, and uh, so I saw a need there. Um, but I also wrote this book um, because um, as an environmental writer, I wanted to tell a uh, more positive, uplifting story than what we usually encounter in environmental writing that can be, you know, can dwell on the grim and the tragic. Um, but not all of our environmental past is grim and tragic. There are success stories, and this is clearly a success story that I wanted to tell. Yeah, that's true. Leopold says that ecologists live in a world of wounds because they see all the challenges that we face. So can you um, tell us a little bit about how did the eagle become our national symbol? Like, who were the advocates for that? Who was opposed to it? In your book, you have some of the backstory. Maybe right. not exactly what I learned in college or maybe right, in first right, grade. Right, right, right. Uh, well, of course, it, it became our national symbol uh, when, when the Continental Congress placed it on the front of the Great Seal of the United States. And, uh, but it wasn't an obvious choice. Uh, the day that um, the, uh, co uh, the delegates to uh, the Continental Congress approved the, the, the Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776, Within a few hours, they, uh, they organized a committee uh, to uh, design a great seal of the United States. I mean, the United States was becoming a nation. A nation needs its coat of arms. It needs its seal. It needs a stamp of, 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 uh, of authenticity. And, and so it took six years before, um, at, and several proposals before Congress decided or, uh, or agreed, uh, or approved, I should say, the great seal that gave us the, uh, the bald eagle. The idea for the bald eagle on the seal came in 1782 at the end of those six years from the Secretary of the Continental Congress, Charles Thompson. And, um, and he uh, made it clear that he wanted the bald eagle, or wanted the eagle to be an American, as he wrote, an American bald eagle. Now. Eagles in heraldry, on coats of arms, on uh, nation state steels, goes way back to the ancients, the Greeks and the, the Romans, but those are non-ornithological eagles. They, you know, they don't represent any particular species. This is the first one that you know, ha is an identifiable species. And in boy, is it identifiable? I mean, you know, with its white head and white tail and, and dark feathers. and. Um, and Europeans were familiar with the, with the bald eagle at that time, and it was an ideal uh, choice because it's truly an all-American bird. The bald eagle only lives in the wild in, in North America. Going to say, were there any opponents to the eagle? Well, um, you know, of course, we all, I think a lot of people know the story of Ben Franklin, who was on the very first SEAL committee that failed miserably that one that was appointed on July 4, 1776, along with Adams and Jefferson. I mean, a star, you know, a, a star cast. I mean, you would think, oh, these guys, they'll, they'll get it in no time. But they failed miserably. I'm not going to tell you who they proposed or what they proposed for the Great Seal, but it'll shock you. And it wasn't the turkey, and that's the myth. Um, ben Franklin, two years after the seal was adopted, um, again in 1782, wrote a letter to his daughter comparing the morality of the bald eagle with the wild turkey. And he called the wild turkey this, um, this uh, brave and, and um, hardworking bird, honest bird, and he called the bald eagle a rank coward and thief. Um, but he never um, uh, proposed a bald eagle for the great seal. What he proposed, I, I'm not going to share. You'll have to read the book. Read the book. Read the book. <laughs> So that you're talking about the mythology of the eagle, and it's a symbol, a symbol of perseverance, a symbol of strength, a symbol of the new nation. But in the beginning chapters of the book, you also talk about some of the myths about the eagle and how much it was misunderstood. Yeah. Franklin's being one example. Some, what are some of the other ways that the eagle is really misunderstood in American history? Yeah, it's... You know, it was not unusual then, even among or early ornithologists, to anthropomorphize the, the, the bald eagle or any animal, and we still do today. And, um, and so while Americans, when, when, when the bald eagle went on the Great Seal in the United States, Americans loved its image. 
uh, they embraced it immediately. And they began putting it on everything else um, in, uh, in, in popular culture. And, and I mean, it, it was a really good image to represent the country. It conveys strength uh, and, and courage and uh, unity. It has that super orbital bone um, a, a, you know, a ridge above its, eye, uh, above its eyes that gives it that don't tread on me stare. So it was perfect for Americans. And, but while they loved the image, they didn't like the living species. Um, they, um, they accused it, wrongfully accused it of all sorts of crimes, uh, mainly that it was a livestock thief, that it could fly away with lambs and, and uh, uh, or sheep and, and, and calves and, and pigs and, and chickens. Now, it can carry away a chicken, um, but it can't lift anything more than five pounds, and that's a large uh, bald eagle that has momentum behind it. And, uh, and mothers were warned, don't leave your child outside alone unattended unless you want a bald eagle to care, uh, you know, steal it away to its nest. And that's a myth that continued well into the 20th century. Uh, into the second half of the 20th century. But ornithologists were even saying this. They were even John James Audubon uh, was, and other leading ornithologists of the day, in, again into the 20th century, were saying that it could carry away all these livestock and, 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 and these children. And, and so consequently, unfortunately, it was treated like any other predator, like a wolf or coyote uh, or a bear or a mountain lion. It was shot. Uh, it was to be eradicated, the living species, and that's the great paradox in the history of the bald eagle. Is we loved the image, but we hated the species, and consequently, we pushed it. Uh, you know, eagle scene was an eagle to be shot. Uh, we uh, consequently, by the late 19th, early 20th century, put, we pushed it, at least in the lower 48, to the brink of extinction. So I'm just going to remind everyone in the audience here or online, if you have questions, please feel free to send them. And uh, we'll, I'll keep talking with John for, uh, for Jack for a little while, and then we'll go to audience questions. But if the question's on your mind now, send it, and it'll show up on my little screen here. Um, so you touched on this, uh, pushing the eagle to the brink of extinction. But in the book, you say we've done that twice. Yes. So could you give us the thumbnail of each of those? Stories. Well, I, the the first time was you know the, the the direct assault on on the bald eagle throughout the 19th and early 20th century, uh, and um, that was halted with the 1940 Bald Eagle Protection Act, and um, which was an unprecedented uh, work of wildlife legislation because it was the first federal law to give protection to a, an individual species. Other protective legislation covered multiple species, um, but that was 1940. Five years later, DDT uh, is released to the general market, and uh, in America, throughout the 1950s, I'm sure people in this room remember, just blanketed the lower 48 with DDT, and so consequently, by 1963, the bald eagle nesting population of uh, 48 states lower 48 was uh, below 500. Let me put that in perspective. When the Europeans first began settling in North America, the estimated um, uh, continent-wide population of bald eagles was, was 500,000. Yeah, so um, we, it, uh, it, I mean, DDT, of course, devastated all sorts of wildlife, particularly bird life. Ospreys, uh, they, they, they also disappeared from, from many parts of of America, um, uh, brown pelicans, white pelicans, uh, they were affected um, uh, by, by uh, DDT as well. Um, and when we were uh, going after eagles as one of the many predators, was that throughout the United States? Did it move east to west? Well, yes, coast to coast. Mm -hmm. um, to, to the point in the eastern states, the bald eagle all but disappeared by the late 19th century. People uh, thought the bald eagle was a Rocky Mountain bird. <laughs> and although when, when they adopted the Great Seal of the United States, there was probably a nest uh, uh, along the Delaware River every mile or two. And, but Alaska in 1917, 
um, adopted La the territory of Alaska in 1917, adopted a bald eagle bounty uh, that lasted until 1952. It was exempted uh, initially from the Bald Eagle Protection Act. And during that period, 1917, 1952, the territory paid bounties on over 128,000 bald eagles. Wow. You had to turn in a set of talons to get your 50 cents. Later, it was went up to a dollar and then two dollars. And, uh, and there were a number of people who opposed the Alaska bounty, but one surprise to me was National Audubon did not oppose mm -hmm. uh, the bald eagle, the eagle bounty in, in Alaska. Wouldn't take a stand against it. Mm -hmm. um, and wouldn't, uh, and initially did not support the Bald Eagle Protection Act. Uh, again, it was, it was a raptor, you know, it was, uh, it, was a, it was a predator, and it was to be controlled even in the minds of the, the uh, National Audubon leadership. So we have a question from our audience. Why is it called bald eagle? They're not bald. They're not bald. Well, I, I, I read about this in the book, and nobody knows for sure why they're, how this started, who named them, first named them the bald eagle, and why they named them the bald eagle. But bald also comes from piebald, so it refers to um, a, a, an, a, an image or an animal with a dark coloring but a white spot or spots and so that that fits but bald also can mean brazen <laughs> and so and these birds were seen as brazen brazen cowards you know don't go together but bra uh, but brazen because they were uh, because they stole from osprey stole fish from osprey in midair stole from each other in midair and they carried away all sorts of livestock that time of the U.S. When, and those opinions of the eagles are in such contrast with the Native Americans' beliefs about the eagles. Can you say a little bit about some of the Native peoples and what they saw about eagles? Where did they fit into their cultures? Yeah, sure. I, um, uh, Native peoples, uh, many Native groups, uh, see the bald eagle as a spirit bird, as a messenger uh, between the earth and uh, ancestors in, in, in the spirit world, and feathers among uh, bald eagles, and in some cases it's, it's golden eagles, uh, are, are conduits to, to that spirit world. Uh, and so feathers and other body parts are in, important in, uh, native, in many Native American rituals and ceremonies. And, um, uh, and uh, Native peoples who uh, for whom the bald eagle uh, is, a, is an important bird in their ceremonies, uh, uh, typically had, at least before the Bald Eagle Protection Act, had designated eagle hunters. And they would go through elaborate rituals before they went out and uh, took an eagle. And uh, they wouldn't take them excessively, they would take one or two. And uh, the Zuni, however, would, would take eaglets, taken meaning kill them and then plucked them. But again, a uh, ceremony in, um, uh, was associated with all this. The Zuni would take uh, uh, an eaglet out of a, a nest, only if there were more than one or uh, one eaglet in the nest, and, and raise it in a stockade and not kill it. And they would, uh, they, they would take the, the molted the feathers. And, uh, but when the Bald Eagle Protection Act was passed in 1940, let me emphasize that Native interaction with bald eagle did not diminish the population. Um, the Bald Eagle Protection Act, after Americans uh, diminished the population, uh, criminalized traditional Native behavior. So, but but today, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife is is working hard to uh, enable the restoration of of those traditions. Yeah. I enjoyed reading your book that some of the trends in the history of the eagle story in the United States paralleled some of our trends in other attitudes to other animals in the country and other trends in conservation um, since the founding as the United States. But you also tell stories of many um, of the heroes in mm -hmm. eagle restoration. And so um, I would like to ask you a question two questions and then you can tell us the answers. Okay. First, it seems that there are a number of people who wanted to or were willing to climb up into bald eagle nests. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm just wondering, have you ever climbed up into a bald eagle nest yourself? No, I, I never have climbed uh, into a bald eagle nest. And, um, and there's, there are a couple of people in my book I, I talk about who, who did that. Uh, and uh, both are right. One, one is uh, 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 David Hancock, who is a, a, um, a biologist, still working well in his 80s uh, in, uh, with, 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 with bald eagles from British Columbia, but has worked around in this part. In 1953, I think it was, when he was 15 years old, um, he was, uh, before he could drive a car, uh, he, was, he was accumulating um, flight hours to, toward, uh, uh, to, toward getting his um, single engine license. And while he was, he was flying around this part of the continent, and he said, gosh, while I'm up here, I might as well do something. And he started counting, you know, monitoring bald eagles uh, nests. And, uh, and he's been working with bald eagles ever since. But at one point, he and his wife climbed up into a bald eagles nest to uh, to ban uh, eaglets, and they, they got stranded because their rope ladder uh, fell apart, and somebody Oops. had to, uh, their assistant had to go retrieve a rope ladder, and it, he finally returned nine hours later. And, uh, uh, and but, the, but the, the one person who I think you're referring to, it was Doris uh, uh, Mager, who lives here now, but when she, uh, when she lived in Florida, uh, she started a, the uh, Eagle re, uh, re, Rehabilitation Program for uh, uh, the Florida Audubon Society in the 1960s in her backyard. And uh, to raise money to build a, um, uh, you know, a, a center, a rehab center for, at Florida Audubon, it, you know, a legitimate one rather than her backyard, in 1979, uh, she climbed a 50-foot tall pine tree and lived in uh, an abandoned eagle's nest for, for six days. She got national attention for this, and she, um, uh, I mean, Life Magazine, uh, Network News, Paul Harvey even talked about her, and, uh, and she s successfully raised the money. And, but then she was 53, 57 years old, no, 53 years old. Then when she turned 60, she rode her bike from San Diego to Merritt Island, Florida, uh, to stopping at Kmart stores. Kmart was her sponsor, uh, giving lectures on the importance of raptors. But she's 96 years old and living in Washington now, and I interviewed her when I was writing this book when she was 94. Everybody I talked to who worked with her in the past said she was you know, she was a groundbreaker, she was outstanding, but she was also a kook. And, <laughs> and she admitted as much. Let me tell you what, she was something, she was one of my best interviewed, just so much energy. Uh, and she said, when COVID's over, I'm getting back out on the road and I'm gonna give lectures at schools uh, on, on the importance of raptors, which she did for decades. Very cool, very cool. So would you tell us a couple more stories about after we shot all the eagles because we were sure they were stealing our children or something like that, yeah. you said, um, how did the recovery happen? What were the actions that people took to get the birds back across the lower 48? So one of the most important things was, there, uh, there were a number of things that happened in 1972. Uh, that was a watershed year for the bald eagle and, uh, and other species too. But uh, Congress, um, um, uh, 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 amended the Bald Eagle Protection Act with, with harsher penalties. Uh, that was in 1972. In 1972, uh, Congress, um, or I should say the EPA, uh, banned uh, the sale of DDT, uh, extremely important for all sorts of wildlife. Uh, also in 1972, Congress, uh, with very decisive bi bipartisan support, passed the Clean Water Act. The bald eagle is a fishing raptor. It'll eat birds, it'll eat land animals, but it prefers fish. And it, and it builds its nest usually within 100 yards or a couple hundred yards of a, a body of water uh, with food. And, uh, and so if we had not passed the, bald, uh, the Clean Water Act, which is 50 years old today, uh, this year, uh, and clean up waters, I mean, we still have a ways to go. 
but uh, the estuarine environments around the country were, were cleaned up for the most part. Lakes and rivers um, you know, brought the aquatic uh, plant life back, which brought the fish life back, which brought the birds back. Uh, and uh, so the, the bald eagle played an important part in its own restoration because um, it has the, you know, upstanding family values, if you will. <laughs> um, they, they mate for life. They maintain a fidelity to their nest for life as long as that nest exists, and a nest can exist for 30 or 40 years as long as a storm doesn't, you know, uh, blow down its tree or... Um, and they um, raise their young with such care that when they leave their natal territory at 16 uh, to 20 weeks, uh, they typically weigh more than their parents. Uh, and, and then everybody leaves at the end of breeding season, and the husband or the male and female come back to that nest, although they, the male goes in one direction and the female goes in another. But they always come back uh, as long as they're, they're, they're alive. But we also instituted these, uh, Fish and Wildlife instituted these really um, uh, unprecedented restoration programs for uh, the bald eagle. Uh, and what they would do is, for instance, the New England states, with the exception of Maine, had no nesting bald eagles. And so uh, Fish and Wildlife would take uh, eaglets at f five, six weeks old out of healthy areas, such as northern Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Canada, uh, Washington and move them to what they were called hack boxes, uh, that, the big giant lion cages I call them on top of stilts, uh, and exposed to the the you know the elements and raise them in these makeshift nests in these hack boxes, feed them um, from behind blinds so they wouldn't imprint on the humans, but they would imprint on their territory. And that territory that they imprint on, in their minds, becomes, becomes their natal territory. And bald eagles will return to their natal territory at breeding age, four to five years, um, and take a mate, build a nest. And it became a huge success across the country, um, the hack programs or hacking it's, programs. It, it's amazing how many populations got restarted yes. by bringing in baby yes. eaglets and how many people were inspired to see that it was possible yes. to restart those populations. And you tell many stories in the book of different people who were involved mm -hmm. in those different activities, other people climbing trees and living in nests to um, uh, put um, tags on birds so individual birds could be tracked and see if they come back yeah. later and things like that. So um, it, was, it, it was inspiring to see how many people went to work yeah. to try to make some of those things happen. Um, yeah, I should say it wasn't just fish and wildlife. It was also uh, state wildlife officials yeah, who, yeah. who really ran the programs. Any other favorite heroes for meagle restoration you want to bring forward tonight? Well, there's Rosalie Edge, who I didn't mention, who uh, took on, uh, and this is when the bald eagle was pushed to the edge of extinction the first time. Uh, when National Audubon, she, put, she was a member of Audubon, and she pushed uh, the, the president of uh, National Audubon, Audubon, T. Gilbert Pearson, and others to uh, take a stand uh, to save the bald eagle and National Audubon refused. So she created her own organization. I love the name that she gave it, the Emergency Conservation Committee. Uh, and uh, uh, for the, the purpose of exposing the duplicity within this, you know, this, the, the, the most, the, the best funded uh, and, uh, most influential conservation organization in those days uh, that would not, you know, support um, the, uh, the the bald eagle, and she and others ultimately succeeded in getting Congress to pass the 1940 Bald Eagle Protection Act. One of the things that I enjoyed about the book is that there are lots of women who are yeah. heroes in these stories, so you'll enjoy that. So tell us a little bit. What's the state of bald eagles today? And what do you forecast for the years ahead for them? So the bald eagle population quadrupled in the 2010s. Uh, after it was taken off the endangered species list in 2007, it was delisted in 2007 when there were approximately uh, 10 to 11,000 uh, nesting pairs across the lower 48. And then quadrupled in the 2010s, and today the estimated Continent-wide population 
is back to 500,000, the estimate mm -hmm. at the time of you know, European contact. Uh, so cool. it's thriving, which is not to say there aren't dangers. The greatest danger right now is lead poisoning from, uh, from, um, uh, from uh, bullets and, and uh, lead shot. And uh, hunters who are among our best conservationists uh, think they're doing the right thing by gutting their kill in, in the woods and recycling into the environment. But um, unfortunately, that those gut piles often are contaminated with lead. And a shard of lead the size of a grain of rice can kill a bald eagle, a, you know, an adult bald eagle. Uh, and, and other animals, other scavengers too. Bald eagles are, are big scavengers. Uh, car strikes are increasingly common. So as their population continues to expand, and as ours does too, uh, there will be more and more collisions between us, I think. Uh, lead has been a challenge for recovering of the condor also, because yes, they're scavengers. The, yes, the and California they, condor. California condor yes, is really it, struggling it with lead. It takes a huge yeah. toll on, on, on the condor's population. So while you were doing the research for this book, um, what are some surprises you encountered on the way? Um, well, there were a number of surprises. Uh, the, the truth about Ben Franklin was one. Uh, the truth about John James Audubon, which I'm not going to share that truth. You have to read the book. Uh, but John, uh, John James Audubon's uh, position um, uh, surprised me. Uh, the, the slaughter, I mean, you know, we, we hear about the bison slaughter of the 19th century, but we don't hear about the bald eagle slaughter, and it was a, and it was it was on you know it was parallel, um, uh, both chronologically and in terms of destruction with with the bison slaughter, um, and and again a, a, a number of these these heroes like Doris Mager, who I didn't know about until I started re researching the book, and Rosalie Edge, who I did know about, but I didn't know her involvement with with the bald eagle, and. Um, so uh, again, there, there are just a number of, of surprises in the book, but those, those are a few. So time for you to start sending in your questions. One of the questions we have is, can you talk a little bit more about eagle nests? Yes, they're, they are, they're very similar to osprey nests. Uh, they're they're well-constructed, they're large, they're the, they're the largest uh, nests of North American birds. One scientist in the 1920s um, measured a nest in, um, that was 35 years old, that was eight feet across and 12 feet deep, and uh, in an old hickory tree that finally, finally said enough is enough and, and went down in a storm, and he estimated the nest to weigh between one and two tons. Do they build it themselves? They, they build it themselves, they build it every year. This is another thing about their family values. They are house renovators. They're constant house. They should be on HGTV, and, uh, except for they don't flip their houses. Uh, they, um, every year when they come back to their nest, they refurbish it, and they, they strengthen it. They add on to it. They bring in um, new cushioning material for the center of the nest where uh, their eggs are, are laid and, and hatched, and uh, the... Uh, the, the um, uh, e eaglets are fed, and so they are, and they're all about location, location, location. They want, a tr they build on the top of trees, uh, and they'll search, they'll search the neighborhood. They'll shop for the right tree. They want a tree that gives them a good lookout over their territory that's within, you know, uh, a short distance or easy access to, to their food, uh, and, um, and that, um, is um, uh, again, it's 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 more one. Um, the scientists uh, of the 1920s I, I talked about it, called it uh, called their territory an eagledom. Eagledom. Yes. Okay. I like that. Uh, one of the things that you note in your book is that some of the research that gets done is done by um, citizens, but some of it's done by scientists. And there's a gentleman. I'm sorry, I forget his name, but you'll remember who was, again, one of these climb up high to watch the birds, but he was one of the early behaviorists. Charles Broly, you're thinking of. Okay. Charles Broly was not a scientist. He no, was no, no, this guy is from Case one? Western. Herrick? Could his name be Herrick? Oh, David Hancock. No. Oh, 
Well, well yeah. so maybe I've got it wrong. I no, thought he Francis, built Harris, Francis Harris was the one from the 1920s. Oh, Did he build you're, you're a the tree one in Ohio, top the one who to measured tree the top to study the birds? Oh, okay. yes. Okay, he's the he one who like measured Because he seemed like an early the, behavioral scientist. Yes, Francis Herrick, who was the one who was at Case Western, okay. uh, who measured that the large eagle nest I talked about. Okay, but what he did, so in Audubon's day, in Alexander Wilson's day, the way ornithologists um, collected, uh, you know, studied birds was to shoot them, mm -hmm. and but. In the late 19th century, when the camera comes along, many ornithologists are putting down their guns uh, and shifting over to the, to the camera. Some of them, some ornithologists, are resisting this. And but Francis Herrick was one of the first people to show how to use a camera in ornithology. He wrote a book uh, on the on the technique. But he, uh, and to study bald eagles, what he did was he built these towers. Uh, near their nesting trees and put a, a tent on top of the tower the size of a sentry box and a tower with a platform and he and his students would hide out in the tent with a camera uh, and, and take pictures. And he got some phenomenal pictures of the domestic life of, of, of bald eagles. Yeah, he's one of my heroes too. He was part of the proof of what, what great family values they had. Yes. Yes. So we have some questions from our audience. Do bald eagles have any natural predators? We're natural. <laughs> um, early on, when the eaglets are, are small, they can become targets of owl, uh, other raptors, uh, owls, and, owls and hawks. Uh, however, as long as an adult is sitting in that nest, you know, they are not going to go anywhere near there. Uh, I, I think that's one of the purpose of the white head. You know, it's a oh. signal. You know, stay away. I'm here, and I'm I am here. But as long as an adult, they they don't fool with the adults. The adults do not have natural predators. Um, I, I should say though, there there was uh, an incident in Mississippi in which uh, bald eagles were were hacked, and um, once they were released, they still hung around a territory, and the young aren't very good at fishing. And a couple of them would fish in this, this pond, wade in and fish in this pond that had an alligator. <laughs> so that was an unusual situation. There was one case that was, that was at least one, um, um, you know, a predator of, natural predator of bald eagles. It got three bald eagles before they, they removed it. The alligator got moved now, to a new home? Yeah, it got mm -hmm. moved to a new home. So another uh, guest asked, I often see crows harassing bald eagles, mm -hmm. maybe for their catch. How do the eagles react to crows in general? Well, what's happening is they're mobbing them, and, and even titmouse will, will mob a, a bald eagle if they, they wander into their nesting territory. Uh, and um, uh, all sorts of uh, birds will uh, mob them to, to say, look, we're not, we don't want you around here. You're not taking our babies. Uh, and so that's probably what the crows are doing, or just... Uh, pushing them out of their territory and telling them to stay away. You know, the same as they do birds at, cat, at bird feeders, you know. Uh, jays uh, and, and uh, other birds will, will um, even small birds, will mob a cat to, to keep it away. On a different angle, do you have any perspective on John James Audubon's Eagle of Washington? Is it a dark bald eagle, or is it a lost species? Um, we're, so you might tell what that is, because I'm yeah. not sure everyone knows what we're talking about. So John James Audubon created a new species, but he wasn't the only one. Ornithologists, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, the, the immature bald eagle, when they leave the nest, they're large. You know, they're the size of their parents are even larger. And so early on, but they don't have their white head and white feathers. They are a chocolate brown. And as they, each year, they, uh, they uh, gain more white in their, in their feathering. Uh, and in their immature years, they'll actually have white spots where they will not have, you know, in their mature years. And so many ornithologists were confusing the immature bald eagle uh, with another species, a non-existent species. And, uh, and that's evidently what John James Audubon did when he identified the, the bird of uh, the, uh, the Washington Eagle or the bird of Washington. And he was, 
you know, I don't want to give away too much, but, you know, he wanted, he wanted to find that, you know, another, another eagle species. And, uh, but he was, he was wrong. He would made the same mistake that other ornithologists made. Now, Alexander Wilson, who preceded him, was a bit older and, and did his ornithology before um, uh, Audubon understood that these, that ornithologists and others were, um, or were misidentifying the I immature, but uh, Audubon saw Wilson as, as a rival and apparently just didn't pay any attention to him. <laughs> well, I think that we were, there was an era in which we were still learning what are the birds of the, yes. of North America. Right. You know, the white people were trying to figure out what birds yep. and name them and send them back to get na named, um, in England and Europe, and so yeah, collecting it's and cataloging yeah. uh, was what dominated ornithology in the 19th century. So then, there's two questions about eagle voices. Yeah. One is, what are their voices like? And the other is, do they have any songs? They do not have songs. They have calls, and their voice is much like a squeaky wheel on a uh, red wagon, a child's red wagon. It's pretty wimpy, as, as I write about. In the opening credits of the Colbert Report, um, with the eagle flying, you know, flag waving, the eagle flying across the screen, and this loud screech, that's a red-tailed hawk voice. Um, and standing in for the bald eagle, it's just not, it just doesn't fit, fit our image of this bird, this muscular bird that is the bird of our country. And... Uh, and uh, but also northern exposure. I'm sure, you know, uh, if you remember that TV show from from the 90s, they had an eagle screeching uh, in their opening credits too, and that that was a red-tailed hawk, um, which is smaller than a bald eagle. <laughs> so, but not more of a squeaky, whistly call. Yeah, it's it yes it it is, uh, and it's it's easily recognizable. Now, the the warning call. Um, if somebody is coming, humans or others are coming into the territory uh, and the, the bald eagles are nesting, the, the male will, will let out a kark, kark, kark. Um, but, and I don't want to try to imitate the, the, the usual wise. call between themselves as, yeah. as they are working their territory. And, but um, it, it would, I'll just leave it at wimpy. I, I do spell out how it sounds in, in the book, but. Uh, and but now let me let me put this in perspective. It may be wimpy to us, but a squirrel hears that wimpy. <laughs> what we see is a wimpy call. That squirrel knows, you know, to to find a hiding place. And, right. and same same with other birds. Right. Well, most the, most raptors don't have songs. You know, they right. they, have, right. they have calls. So it's a different um, way of communicating. Um, let's see. So we could use more questions from the, from the audience. We've had a couple of votes for the um, ones that we've a already answered. So you're allowed to both ask your question or vote on questions that other folks have posed. Um, I'm curious for you, have you, um, in the course of writing the book, traveled around the country and seen eagles in their many different habitats? And do you have a favorite place you've seen eagles in the wild? You know. I, I don't want to say I have a favorite place uh, and because there's so many places where you can go eagle watching and the, I, I, I went to Alaska, I went to the Aleutian Islands and to Dutch Harbor and it's a wonderful place. Dutch Harbor is a, the, um, the busiest commercial fishing port in the United States and so naturally um, it attracts bald eagles. Again, they're, they're great scavengers. And at one time, they were, you know, during the eagle bounty, they were killing them because they were seen as competition for salmon fishing, and which, which is pretty ridiculous. Um, and, but uh, that, that was a good place that I went. Um, I took my daughter, teenage daughter and her cousin, and we had a really good time. Uh, I went to Conowingo Dam, Conowingo Dam in northern Maryland, um, which is uh, you know, hundreds of bald eagles 
uh, congregate there uh, in the wintertime uh, because as the fish run through the dam, they, they come out uh, downside, either stunned or, or dead, so they're easy pickings. But as many, uh, there, there are as many wildlife photographers there as there are bald eagles, uh, and uh, which, which I found is interesting. And I write about this in, in, in the book. And uh, right 10 minutes from my house, a place called Paines Prairie Preserve, I've seen the most spectacular um, bald eagle activity. Um, um, bald eagles fighting in midair over fish engaged in aerial battles. I went out with a photographer uh, a, a number of times last year, and we saw, ball, uh, we saw two bald eagles fighting over fish in midair, and, that, and the fish went between them five times. And, you know, one would force the other to drop it and then catch it. Uh, and then the other one would come back and force it to drop it and, and catch it. Uh, and stealing from osprey. Uh, and just watching them coming in and grabbing a fish out of the water is, is a spectacular sight. Um, yeah, you can certainly see the interplay between eagle and osprey here, where the yeah. osprey may be efficient hunters, but the eagle will go chase them down. And right, right. Back and forth. Yeah, and, and another another uh, place to see bald eagles, an unfortunate place, and it's been written about in the newspaper here, is uh, you know your local landfill. Mm -hmm. um, and they, um, it was, I, in fact, I did a photo shoot down there for a magazine a few weeks ago down in Florida, and at the the Sarasota County landfill, they wanted to ensure they got a picture of me for their article with bald eagles. So we went out to the dump. <laughs> And uh, along with, you know, hundreds of thousands of other birds. And, uh, and we, we got the shot. I'm sorry that was so predictable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the questions from our audience is, uh, should there, are there actions we should be taking now to help protect eagles? First of all, love them, which, which we do. Uh, there's, no, there's no question about that. And that, and that translates into protection. Uh, and um, one of the best, um, some of the best advice is not to throw, and I, not a lot of people do, but don't, don't throw, you know, your food out your car window on the side of the road uh, or, or leave any kind of food scraps uh, side of the road because they'll, they'll get down and dirty just like uh, turkey vultures and, and black vultures and they get struck by cars. Uh, the... Um, the other thing is uh, just support uh, your local um, you know, organizations that help protect bird life and bald eagles. And, and the states don't uh, conduct an official census of bald eagles anymore since the bald eagle was delisted in 07. But many organizations do conduct a census uh, of nesting eagles. And it's, it's volunteer to be uh, a nest monitor. Uh, that's always helpful for both the bald eagles and, um, and, and groups that are keeping track of their population and, and uh, support them in any way that you can. Um, but again, just love them. I mean, we look, people, I get, people come up to me all the time and tell me, oh, there's a bald eagle nesting in our neighborhood now, it wasn't there a few years, or on the golf course, on the school campus. Uh, scientists didn't think that they would live around um, uh, people, around civilization like coyotes and and raccoons do and uh, but they they do we they they accept us and, and 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 but so far we're accepting them well we've seen a lot of change when i was growing up i was born in pennsylvania when i was growing up there were no bald eagles yes on that part of the country exactly, then exactly right um, yeah. and now there are and, yeah uh, something like 400 nesting pairs yeah in some pennsylvania now times have changed there's yeah. signs of hope so were you always a bird watcher and an eagle fan no, I wasn't. You know, I grew up spending a lot of time in the outdoors, and I, I don't consider myself a birder now, but uh, I, you know, growing up in Florida, I watched the, the large bird life, wading birds in particular, uh, return. Because when I was a kid in the 70s, uh, fishing around, around Tampa Bay, you, your fishing luck was very poor because the bay was on the bird, bird's ecological death, and you didn't see bird life, maybe a brown pelican or two, and or gulls, but but not, you know, herons and egrets and ibises and ospreys. And but I remember when uh, um, 
we got word that an osprey was nesting on Tampa Bay. This was in the 80s. You know, people drove to find a nest. And, um, uh, and it's just wonderful to see this. When we see bird life, healthy bird life, we see a healthy environment. We see a healthy habitat for ourselves. And I think a better quality of life. We, we like the birds. We appreciate them. And when they're fishing, we can fish. No, I think birds do tell us how it's yes. going. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's one more question from the audience, and then, sadly, it's almost time to wrap up. Can eagles be tamed and trained? And could such, or such as sometimes injured eagles are, could they be mm -hmm. permanently housed in wildlife rehabilitation they're, centers? Yeah, um, they're not, uh, bald eagles are not the best candidates for, for training, and uh, they, they can, there, have, there has been limited success. The American Eagle Foundation in Tennessee, actually at Dollywood, has had some success. The birds, the eagles that you see flying around stadiums, um, sports stadiums um, or car races tend to be eagles from the American Eagle Foundation, unreleasable ones. And um, but um, to, to get one of those, you have there for every one of those birds, a bald eagles that you can train to that extent, uh, and not much more. There are numerous others that you can't. And uh, hawks are, are 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 better for you know for for, for such things. The earlier falconers knew what they were doing. And falconers as well, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. So, sir, or falcons, I there's, say. we're running out of time here, sadly. Um, do you have anything you want to read to us to close the program? Yeah, um, I, so I'm going to, I want to read to you um, a, near the end of the book, um, uh, a little story that is local. And this is on Skagit Bay in the 21st century, and essentially gives a sense of how we went from uh, disliking or even hating the, uh, the living species, but uh, came to respect it. On a gray fall morning early in the 21st century on Skagit Bay in northwestern Washington state, a bald eagle sat atop a tall weathered piling watching. Its white head pivoted and its eyes blinked when, 100 yards away, a man approached the bay's edge carrying a Winchester pump-action 12-gauge shotgun. The man hunkered down in the eelgrass along the soggy tidal flats. He was wearing a jacket, pants, and hat, the color of the gray-green and amber surroundings, and almost disappeared into them. But the eagle could see him as easily as it could see a loon on the open water. The predator bird's ancestors had learned to be wary of someone carrying a gun and to fly quickly away from it. But the eagle at Skagit wasn't fleeing. It was anticipating. A person like the one on the fall morning was reason to stay put. The man's name was Paul Armbrust, which made no difference to the eagle. What made a difference was that armbrust was ensconced in the eelgrass waiting to shoot a duck. The eagle sensed what might follow his presence and remained attentively positioned on the piling. Armbrust was alone and without a retriever, which meant he would have to slosh out into the water to fetch the duck if he scored a hit. When his first duck fell, it landed at, in the water as expected. Then before Armbrust could put aside the 12 gauge and stand up, the eagle swept down, lowered its legs with toes and talons open, clamped them around the floating limp muscle of duck, and rose skyward on pumping wings, all in a single breathless motion. Armbra stared in disbelief as he watched his evening's roast duck with cherry rosemary sauce being flown away. He swore half under his breath, the kind of son of a bitch swearing that reflected both annoyance and awe. There was the theft, yes, but there was also his witness to what had occurred, seeing close up the gleaming white head, implacable yellow eyes, and horizon broad wings, feeling the squall of the air that came off the feathered flight during the downward glide and upward thrust, and being present for the feet and the aesthetic beauty of motion. Before all this happened, Armbrus had noticed the eagle over on its piling when he first settled in the eelgrass. 
He momentarily admired the bird, its beautiful white tail feathers draping down below the piling's rim. He even smiled, but then thought nothing more of the eagle. That's where, he later realized, his mistake was. Although the eagle had slipped out of his mind, Armbrus never left the eagles. If balls routinely spend time around a body of water and Skagit Bay had uh, phalanxes of them, there is surely a, a perch somewhere along it, most often a tree with bare branches and an open view of the territory. An eagle sitting in such a tree in the morning or evening is likely hunting, as Armbrus was hunting from the grass. The man with his gun, the bird with its wits, magnified vision, and bullet speed. There, there beside the bay, the piling had become the prime perch of the day. Sometime after the duck abduction, Armbrus saw the feathered hunter return and take up its post again. But maybe this wasn't the same eagle as before. Maybe another opportunist had come in the absence of the first. Would eagles start lining up for a fast and easy meal, like Armbrus might later have to do at a restaurant drive through if he ended the day empty-handed? Eyeing the bird, Armbrus swore to himself that he would not be outsmarted by an eagle a second time. He would reach the next duck before his savvy opponent did. The eagle was watching him too, seeing the man's mindful glances toward the piling, the muscle twitching, muscles twitching in his jaw, the determination in his squinting eyes and puckered lips. Armbrus welcomed that contest. The eyes of man and bird were on the same prize. Before the next duck hit the water, Armbrus was up and moving. So was the eagle. Splashing through the eelgrass and muck, Armbrus was prepared to dive for the downed prey if he had to, like a base runner sliding on his belly and reaching for home plate. The bird was fast, but the man bested him. Armbrus got the prize and crowed his victory. He had dinner in his hand. And he had a story to tell the next time he was tippling an IPA at a backyard barbecue. Maybe he would host one himself, and soon, just so he could tell the tale. Who knows what the eagle was thinking as it banked and returned to its perch, all part of a routine workday in nature. The eagle's endeavors reminded Armbrus that the world did not exist for his benefit alone. Out in the tidal flats, he was in a community of others, he was a lowly outsider among so many insider species. People from his grandfather's generation and before would not have tolerated the brazenness of a duck-snatching eagle. They would have shot it before it swooped down for a free lunch. Armbrus could not imagine doing that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Please join me in thanking this gentleman for reading and for writing his book. Thank you. This, this closes our program this evening. Thanks to Town Hall for bringing Jack to visit us. Yes, and for those of you. you who are here in person, um, please come up and say hello, get books signed, go over and buy yourself a book. Thanks very much. <laughs>